Hey friends, I just want to invite you to consider joining the Theology Nara Patreon community. This is a group of followers who believe in the ministry and work of Theology Nara and want to support it financially. And honestly, I've been so impacted by the people who have chosen to support this podcast. Um, every month they send in a bunch of questions. A lot of them are really personal and I get to spend time responding to them in a private podcast. And we, you know, we'll message each other throughout the month and post responses to each other's questions. Um, I'm actually going to start something new this fall, a month live Zoom chat with some of the members, and I'm super looking forward to actually seeing more of their faces every month. And there's other perks to come up, like, you know, they all get free, uh, a free virtual pass to the Theology Nara Exiles in Babylon conference every year. But honestly, I don't want to make it sound transactional. Every single Patreon member that I've talked to says the same thing. We like all the perks, uh, we're thankful for them, but we're just more thankful to support the ministry of theology in the raw, and we're glad to do so. So if this is you, if you've been impacted by Theology in the Raw, you can join the Theology in the Raw community for a minimum of five bucks a month by going to patreon.com forward slash Theology in the Raw. That's patreon.com forward slash Theology in the Raw. Um, the link is in the show notes. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is Doug Smith. Uh, Doug is a passionate voice in the epic battle against screen addictions. And he wrote a book recently called uh, Unintentional, How Screens Secretly Shape Your Desires and How You Can Break Free. Uh, break free. That was the subject of our conversation. We talked a lot about how technology, smartphones, social media is really doing a number on us. And honestly, I mean, he said some things that were pretty eye-opening stuff, I guess I've already kind of heard in some spaces, but to get them verified from him was a little eerie. Um, just how much big tech is in our houses and lives and pockets and in our minds and grabbing our hearts. So we had a really good conversation about this really important topic. And I, um, I hope that uh, you are challenged by it and that we all would make some better discipleship decisions with how we manage technology in our life. So please welcome to the show for the first time, the one and only Doug Smith. Doug and I met briefly at the Exiles of Babylon conference last year, um, but <laughs> we were just chatting offline and Doug's been listening to the podcast back when it was a 15 minute radio show. That I mean, that goes back. I think I start, I started it in 2014 and I think it became yeah. a po podcast in 2015 and, and it was kind of a both and for a little bit. That's How did you even come across it? Through, through just the podcast app or... Um, yeah, it was through a podcast app. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think, um, like I was, I was saying, like I first joined, uh, I first, uh, ran across you through your book, Erasing Hell, right. uh, cause I joined into the, I was following the hell conversation and, and at the time, and that was such a great book. Um, but I, uh, I think I found your name through that and I had okay. been in that conversation. And so I'm an avid podcast listener. Okay. Uh, it was just through a podcast app. Oh, that's great. It was, um, it was fantastic. So your book is unintentional. Um, read the subtitle again, How Screens Shape Your Desires. Um, yeah, it's called un Unintentional, How Screens Secretly Shape Your Desires and How You Can Break Free. Okay. I mean, I, I, and I've talked about this on the air. This is why I wanted to have you on because I, I, I feel like, and, and we talk about it a lot. I feel like people do talk about it. It's not like it's, it's not a conversation. And, and I know like Andy Crouch has done really good work and, and others. Oh, yeah. Um, but it just seems, I don't... I don't see a ton of changes happening in, in people's lives. And I don't know. I, it just seems like the conversation needs to be louder. Do you, do you find that to be true too? I mean, obviously you felt the need to write a book when there are other books, I think on the topic, but. Oh, there are a lot of other books. And you mentioned Andy Crouch's book. It's that's a great book. It's a, uh, it's, it's very pastoral mm -hmm. and, and kind and gracious and it's really real and humble and it's really great. And I, mm -hmm. and I love his book. Um, I, I decided to write a book in this space because I didn't really see the case being made as I get what I tell people is books like Andy Crouch's are more pastoral. Mine is a little more prophetic. Okay. It's a little more, this is really significant. This is really serious. And, okay. um, you really, really need to take it seriously. And so I, I have a lot, I make a pretty serious case. I come from a background, uh, as a lifelong software engineer. Oh, okay. So I approach it kind of from a technical and a nerdy space. I also approached the subject from, you know, as a lifelong um, Bible student. And then of course, as a dad of four grown daughters. And so oh, wow. all that kind of blends together with a lot of other things uh, to make me very passionate about it. But yeah, just like you said, I'm not seeing the changes. People, we hear about it, but still all the families are in the restaurant, all on their phones. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's all, all these things are just happening around us and it's really hurting us. Yeah. And I just want to really draw 
uh, people's attention to it. What was the um, Netflix special that I thought was going to wake everybody up? Because everybody saw it. It, um, it was the Social Dilemma. Yeah. That the one is that what the one you're talking about yeah, where the yeah. industry like Tristan Ferris? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, I, w- when you saw that, th- did you feel like that was pretty spot on? And do you deal with a lot of the similar things in your book, or, or what, what were your thoughts on that on the movie? I, I don't have the credit. I don't have the um, the knowledge base to say it was like on, on or off. If it's even close to the truth, it, it was pretty eerie. <laughs> It was, and it was. Um, I I only read about it. I didn't actually watch it. I don't actually have Netflix <laughs> among oh. <laughs> my among my practices <laughs> okay. of, of okay. Uh, kind of being intentional. I don't actually have Netflix, but I did read about it, and okay. I'm I've read their work. Like I followed Tristan Ferris, um, and and some of the others. So what they were saying is true, uh, definitely true. I mean, they, so they approach what what they're talking about is the intentionally addictive practices of the industry, and that's a lot of what my first four chapters are in my book is talking Inten- about. Okay, they're you- doing this on purpose. Um, it's just, I guess, my problem with well, at least how I the the way I read the documentary was that it was almost like, hey, we've done all this stuff. Yeah, we've made billions and billions of dollars out doing it, but uh, sorry, you know, <laughs> there wasn't like a, a solution to that, you know, other than, you know, try to, uh, well, Tristan is, and he's doing a great thing, I think, in trying to call the industry to accountability, right? They're, he's talking to the industry, be more, um, you know, do the right thing, be more like uh, environmentally safe or whatever, you know, yeah. that kind of green <laughs> for technology. Um, my project is different than that because it, it's my, mine's a Christian book asking Christians sure. to, in fact, the reason I really wanted to talk to you, I mean, lots of reasons I've been wanting to talk to you, but uh, the reason I really want to talk to you is that a couple of years ago, you mentioned um, you had you interviewed the author of Analog Church. Yeah. And you said that, um, you know, there's just not enough books on our discipling us with our technology. Yeah. And I actually said to the podcast app, I've written that book, Preston. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, that's that's what my book is. It's really about a kind of a wake up call and then a discipleship about you, that. You use the phrase in passing and uh, so just to let my, you know, I let my audience know, I just crawled out of bed. I've been up, I mean, s- sleeping with the flu. And so my hat, oh. my head is really mushy right now. I'm really, I wouldn't cancel this interview for the world, but my, I'm going to forget, forget my own name. So if I forget yours, um, the, no problem. No offense. <laughs> um, you use the <laughs> phrase in passing about the intentional addictive. Can you, can you, what was that? And can you expand on that for people that might not be aware of that? Absolutely. So that's that's one of the big things. The reason my book is called Unintentional is that when I when I watch people and the way that they are approaching technology, the way that they just basically accept everything that comes along, um, mm. you know, we just get a new this and a new that, and we give our kids this and we give our kids, you know, all the things. Everybody's doing it. Why? Well, they don't they don't mean to. They don't mean to um, embrace a lifestyle that really becomes addictive. But the industry is very intentional in the way that they make their products addictive. And we're talking about, um, you know, hiring top neuroscientists, behavioral psychologists, Mm. experiment after experiment, exploiting our our behavioral psychology and and uh, neuroscience. You know, they're they're the the way that they're able to figure out what works and what doesn't is the um, on the one hand, as an as a nerd, you're like, wow, that's amazing. And on the other hand, as a as a Christian and as a as a dad and everything, that's that's it's wrecking us. Look what it's doing. And so most people don't realize why is everybody on their phone all the time? Well, because their phones are intentionally addictive. Hmm. In fact, uh, one of the talks I do compares big tech to big tobacco <clears throat> because their practices are nearly identical. Really? Yeah, in terms of ex- in terms of making their products intentionally addictive. Can you, um, what, what, which, okay. You just said the phone, like, is it, are you talking about social media? Are you talking about, um, even YouTube texting? Yes. I mean, just all of the texting or, I mean, emails or like what, what when you say phone, well, are you primarily social media? What, and what would, what would you classify as social media? Yeah. This is a personal a question point. because we, we, we've always said we don't allow our kids on social media. I wouldn't be, we don't, but, yeah. um, they do have YouTube. And they yeah. do like videography stuff and like, but then I don't know. I'm like, well, and we don't allow like interaction. We just say no comments, no interaction, you know? Um, yeah. We'll see if they actually are doing that. <laughs> we haven't checked a while, but, um, I don't know. I'm like, I, I, even, even as a household that we're fairly vigilant, like I, I, it's sure. trying to come for me to look around and say, we're all on our phones. What the heck? I'm on my phone, you know? Like, <laughs> right. Right. 
but you didn't, but nobody decided to do that, you know? And yeah, I want to come back to that, but that's, that's the thing is that, um, what I often tell people is that, that, so because the, the average person, when you look at the numbers, the average people, the numbers rose in 2021, I updated my book in 2021 to show that the average is people are spending eight hours a day consuming digital media. And yes, that's streaming video, social media, and video games primarily. So those are the, those are the main, those are the things that are really amped up in terms of the addictive quality. And okay. so, yeah, YouTube does fall into that, right? Okay. YouTube has autoplay and that's the, yeah. that's the quintessential unintentional feature right there. It's <laughs> like, I don't know what to watch next, but YouTube knows what I want to watch next. So, mm-hmm. and then how many of us have spent the time, you know, it's like, I only intended to spend f- five minutes, but now, so I tell people, did you mean to spend, did you grow up thinking, I wish I could spend the equivalent of a full-time job every week selling my most private, intimate, personal data to the most powerful corporations in the world. You know, I did not, we didn't want to do that. We didn't sign up for that. So we're unintentional, but the industry is intentional and, and right. And they talk, they talk about it very boldly. In fact, selling data, can you expand on that? Cause I keep hearing this, like when I'm, when my phone's open and I'm scrolling or whatever, is it, 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 are there, is there somebody behind the machine that's like seeing or the machine itself that's like seeing how long I linger on this tweet or this Instagram post or this whatever, like, is that? That's exactly right, Preston. It's in fact, it's just more than you can imagine. I tell people it's, it's this, it's an ongoing conversation between your device and what they call the cloud, the, um, okay. the, the backend systems, the huge, huge server farms that are not only are they watching like to the millisecond level, how much did you linger? Did you like this? Did you not? Did you comment? Did you did you not? Um, did you just swipe on by? Did you play it? How far did you play it? What kind of video? So they build up this this basically your digital autobiography about totally. you and what works on you. And so then they'll try. Okay, he's kind of like this. He's probably about this age. He's probably whatever. What works on him? Did this work? No. So it's a it's we're we're in a petri dish, right? We're under a microscope, uh-huh. being watched and um and evaluated, and then um. Not only that, but they'll do experiments even uh, to split the the so so with that data. Then they'll say, okay, try this on you know thirty percent of our audience. Try this on thirty percent of our audience and see what works better. And then um, one of the books I quote in my book is called Irresistible by Adam Alter, and he really chronicles this down to the brain science and so on. He calls this weaponizing of the experience. So it's literally by running all these experiments, and again, social media, video streaming, and video games are the primary ones where they're weaponizing this ability to exploit our behavioral psychology, mm. and then, um, yeah, and then use that against us. So then we end up spending again the equivalent of a full time job. Yeah, that's crazy. That's when insane. we didn't mean to. Would um, I, I, this is gonna sound even conspiratorial when I say it, but like, what about? Because I've had a couple of eerie moments where my wife and I will be having a conversation about like, would you ever want to go to Costa Rica? I've heard people say it's night, da, da, da. and all of a sudden I got ads of Costa Rica popping up. Like, yep. <laughs> is that? Can they, I mean the audio? Yeah. you can't. You can't be. I mean, there's. Are you serious? Like, it's. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. They hear I our. Mean, the, they um, whoever they so, are hear our conversations and are putting ads that connect with that. Absolutely. Yeah. When, when people, so you can turn off some of that, right. Um, but like if Facebook asks for your microphone permission, you don't, <laughs> you don't want to give it that, um, the, the, like the Hey Siri and the, um, you know, the equivalent on the Android platform, you know, those kind of things has to be listening all the time. Right. So I, I won't have a smart home speaker in my home because they're always listening, even though they say, Oh, we're not, you have to always be listening or else if you said Alexa, it wouldn't, wake up. Right. So it's, yeah, they're, they're definitely doing that every possible way they can possibly sell you something they will. And I've had that experience. That's not anecdotal. It's absolutely a thing. Is it through Alexa or through my, like if I, my phone's on airplane mode right now. So right now they can't hear our car. Who, I keep saying That's they, right. I feel like I'm in 1984 or something <laughs> like big brothers. <laughs> right. I know. Where's my tinfoil hat? I I my- <laughs> but you're saying it's not like, this is not, this is not like, um, hidden, like this is common knowledge. Oh yeah. They write books on it. They teach on it. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I can see where you can geek out on it from a software perspective. Like that's oh, yeah. crazy technology. It is crazy technology. Yeah. I did scramble my algorithms once, um, on Instagram 
I, you know, cause Instagram, there's all kinds of stuff pops up and I'm like, I, there's stuff I don't need to see, you know? And so yes. I, I just started clicking on every single otter, a cute little otter video. Um, <laughs> and next thing you know, I got just nothing but otters on my phone, but I actually do yeah. like, so that would just, I, I'll scroll otter videos and now I'm sucked into that. Now they're probably going to sell me an otter or something. I don't know. <laughs> I actually looked into seeing if it's legal and it's not in, in, in America to buy an otter. <laughs> 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 but that's, that's yeah awesome. my wife loves otters yeah <laughs> how can you not like an otter it's an otter it's so awesome. i know yep um so tell us about the four, first four chapters you said that you deal with yeah. a lot of this stuff so you're citing hard data and really kind of saying this is this is what is going on behind the scenes with the phone i am yeah i've i really did kind of geek out it has 179 footnotes so it's <laughs> it's pretty well researched. I mean, one of my, one of my best friends. Uh, so I, as I went through the book process and, you know, had it critiqued, I had my little critique group. And, uh, one of my best friends was a, a kind of a friend who could say, um, uh, Doug, that chapter's good, but it's not this book. You know, what, what, this is the kind of friend and the kind of critiques yeah. you need. And so one of the things he would do is he would say, uh, Doug, who says, cause I would make a claim and he'd like, well, back that up, back that right, up, back right, that up. Right, so yeah. I just want to shout out. Thanks to Kevin for, um, <laughs> 179 footnotes because that's okay. that's why the book. So anyway, the first four chapters has a lot of that. So the first chapter um, talks about becoming aware of what's happening. So I really want to ease the on-wrap. The, one of the problems with a book like this is that people don't really want to hear it, right? Hmm. It's like, I know I probably have a problem with my screens, but I'd rather not even think about it, right? So it's not, it's not, you know, it's kind of like, I want to listen to Jeremiah, but I actually really don't want to hear what Jeremiah has to say. <laughs> and so, so anyway, I try to ease people on, okay, this is probably what's happening. This is, um, not probably, this is what's happening. Did you realize you're spending this much time or most people are spending this much time? Did you realize one of the things I can bring to it because I am like Gen X or, you know, mm -hmm. I can bring a perspective of, Hey, back in the seventies, uh, things were different. Mm -hmm. Did you realize that you know how much things have changed. You realize that there's been almost 2 billion iPhones sold. Um, it's like the most successful product of all time. Wow. Did you know, um, and then, you know, how many, how much time people are spending on their devices. And then, as you just mentioned, you know, things are coming up more than all the time where it's, it's the darkness of the content, the sexualization, yeah. the, um, you've even met, you even mentioned in embodied in your book, you talk about, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, anxiety and depression and yeah. suicidality and the youth. And, and that can be traced back. I, I quote, um, Jean Twenge who yeah. wrote on this. She, she's one of the experts on that, right. About, I read that a while ago. That was, yeah, that was eye opening. Yeah, yeah. It's super eye opening. And it's just, you know, you can just trace it right there when iPhone and or smartphone saturation past 50%, we watch those poor mental health yeah. metrics just crank right up and it's, it's really disturbing. And so, hmm. um, anyway, so, the first, that's the first chapter is waking us up to that. Second chapter prepares us by talking about, um, the mechanisms behind it. So it's like, okay, Doug, what is actually happening? And so I get into mechanisms like, um, uh, like the autoplay, like, um, I, I get into, so there, there's people who have written, like I've said, um, one of the authors is near AL. He wrote a book called hooked, which is, um, uh, how basically how to make technology addictive. <laughs> and, oh, wow. um, another author, one of the other authors is Chris Notter. He wrote a book called, um, evil by design. And, uh, his, his is really great. I was really great to find it because it actually patterns strategies on how to make technology addictive after the classic seven deadly sins. So he actually, and it's, it's got, you know, the horns and everything. I'm like, it's, it totally makes my case. And he's just tongue in cheek, right? Yeah. He's like, you know, cause if you're a software engineer and you want, you want to build an app and you want to make people love your app and be engaged. Yeah. Well, here's the strategies yeah. appeal to their pride, appeal to their gluttony, appeal to their lust, appeal to their, you know, the oh, seven wow. deadly sins. And here's how you do it. You make things feel scarce. You make things, you make autoplay. So, so then people are lazy. They won't make another decision. You, you know, so on and on and on. So I, I detail that. Um, one of the things about chapter two that I, that I really like is, is, um, I, I call this the double bind uh, the messages of our, of our, um, technology. And really for a long time have been this idea of go with your gut, do what you feel. How do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. Do you like it? Do you not? So we're always spending this time in our feelings, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever you feel is kind of your, becomes your identity. In fact, you know, that's kind of a thing, right? Where on the other hand, they tell us what we should feel, how we should act on our feelings, what we should buy because of how we feel, how we should vote, mm -hmm. you know, what we should laugh at, all that kind of thing. So I call this double bind. It's like this, you should act on your feelings. Here's how you should feel. And this is how, oh, wow. um, the mechanisms work. And 
ultimately keep us working. And one of the one of the things that's uh, that also gets pointed out in that is one of the early Facebook investors, some of these people who are kind of splintering off and going, you know what, I'm out because this is just wrecking people. Mm. Um, one of the early investors was like, um, uh, this they're doing this on purpose. In fact, the the reason people are more angry is that the algorithm optimizes for outrage. It's actually optimized for outrage. So you hear people, you know, digital courage, they'll say whatever, like that's built into the algorithm because you end up seeing things that make you more angry, especially, you know, 2020, 2016 election cycles, even we just got through an election cycle. So all that it's bringing out the worst in us hmm. and to their profit and our expense. I would, that, that was, um, I wrote this down. I wanted to ask you about that because you've been talking about like social media and advertising, but what about like news outlets? Um, I have heard, I think this was, was this social? No, there's a, um, a journalist who wrote a book. I'm blank. I'm, I think her name is Batyar. Batyar. It's like a, mm. it's hard. I, I can't pronounce her name, but she wrote a book that, um, I heard her on a couple podcasts talking about how the way the news has gone to a subscription base where they need people subscribing to get money and they know that outrage keeps them subscribing and that this right. has led to the model now shifting. I don't know when it shifted five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years or whatever. It has just absolutely created these angry echo chambers, which mm -hmm. we saw just come to a head in, in 2020. Um, is that, yeah. can you, so that you're saying that that's, Talk to us about how how um, we and maybe talk to us about how we should be suspicious. <laughs> of yeah, how we get our news um, through our phones. Right. Yeah. That's so this something I mentioned in in chapter one again is that is the idea that um, I think sixty seven percent or so people get their news through social media. Okay. But then a higher percentage don't even trust that. Right. So they're building a distrust, but the but they're still getting it through their social media. And it just like you said, it, it builds these echo chambers. Um, it's so tragic. Um, one of the things that breaks my heart, I've read stories of, um, of especially um, like boomer generation, people in their 70s <laughs> where where they're um, uh, where, where they're they're they believe all this stuff. They don't have a, a, a healthy skepticism toward these kinds of things. So. Uh, it's really, really sad. But yeah, you're exactly right. The news media, <laughs> I put it in quotes, news, right? <laughs> it's a, what we have to ultimately remember is the goal of every app or website is to keep you watching. It's not to tell you the truth. It's not to help you. It's not to, um, you know, it's not to help you make wise and reasoned decisions. It's to, uh, what I've been saying more more lately is it's to disciple us. It's to yeah. disciple us no, that's good to want to become consumers of whatever they have. And so, you know, when we start relating to things on the right or the left, we're just going to get more of that and more of that and edgier more of that. Yeah. And on and on and on. Um, it works on the, in the pornography world as well. Right. I yeah. mean, it's like people get hooked on a little bit of Instagram. Like you talked about, I don't want to see that on Instagram. Well, right. a lot of people do, and then they want to see more and then they do, and then they do, and then it goes mm. down yeah. violent and horrible places. So it's all of that is again, the one goal, keep you watching, so that yeah. then you become a consumer of whatever they want to sell you. It was subtle. Like I, I do a lot of like travel um, Instagram pages, like that, mm -hmm. that have amazing, amazing pictures of like my, my favorite. My favorite type of geography is the the like the Maldives, Tahiti, that that mm. aqua, that deep blue where you see the boat yes. floating like fifty feet above water, and it looks like it's floating in the air. Like I just th those sandbars. Um, but I noticed after a while, some of those, you know. Oh, here's a girl in a bikini. Oh, yeah. The sandbar. And then another one, another one. That's when I started doing my otter thing. Or, or I started doing surfing videos, which um, the, so far there's a bit hard. <laughs> there's no like yeah. surfers in string bikinis right. on some like 40 foot wave or something. So, so I right, still get my right. beach fix without all the, the lingerie or whatever. But um, uh, yeah, it's, cr it's just crazy. I mean, now that you know a little bit, it's comical. Like I just like how, how you can just alter stuff just by being like intentional about it but um i, I really want yeah. to camp out the news thing though because I, I i think that this is i mean we saw that it created a discipleship crisis in 2020 and i think right. i think i think this create the news channels they're, they're they're they need to survive their ratings are down and they're just trying to get people yep. outraged get them in the echo chamber it's all for we're just being used like pawns in some financial game and it's just, mm -hmm. it ripped the church apart in 2020. Would you, is that too strong of language? I mean, I just, I saw it anecdotally everywhere. And then the few things I've read, I'm like, oh, this is, this is not just 
this is actually happening. Like this is intentional. No, it is. I mean, lifelong friends disagreed over, you know, and unfriended each other on social oh, yeah. media because of their, they said one thing political that was offensive to someone else. And, you know, you think about 20, 30 year friends and, you know, mm-hmm. and churches, absolutely. You know, it's, we've become so very sensitive to trigger words and mm-hmm. things that, again, through the optimization, through that, Ooh, that makes me mad. I'm going to comment on that. And so again, it is discipling us. It's teaching us how to not only what to think about, but how to respond to <laughs> how it. How to feel. And how, to, how to, right. Yeah. How to feel. Yes. Rather than how to think. Right. right. No. <laughs> um, one of the books I, I bring into the, my conversation is um, Amusing Ourselves to Death by oh, Neil yeah. Postman. Oh, I mean, gosh. that's such, so good. you know, it's prophetic, right? Yeah. I mean, it was written in the eighties and it goes against television but it's so prophetic. And yeah. the new, his chapter on the news is yeah. just like, even back then, right? Cause he would just say his, the chapter on the news is called now this. And, yeah. <laughs> and it, and it, what it just talks about it, you know, you could hear about this horrible, you know, we had this, uh, you know, there's this war in Ukraine and then, Oh, here's this, here's this hamburger commercial. And then here's this horrible tragedy and this famine yeah. in Africa. And don't you want a new car? Yeah. And you know, we're not building critical thinking. We're not building the ability. And then what do you do about it? And right. and it builds the numbness. So then that's all amped up yeah. now. Yeah. What do you, so here's what I've been doing. I, I, I either got rid of, maybe they're still on my phone. I, I don't, I, I used to have news apps. They might mm-hmm. still be on. I, I took them off during 2020. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, I don't, I do two things. Uh, you probably, if you listen to my podcast, the pour over podcast, it gives you seven oh, minutes. Yeah. Here's the major events. So you're, cause I think it's good to be informed. Yeah, um, me too. And it really is. You, you can't, and I know the guys who do it and is you can't pin them on where they are politically. Like they're, they're really good at just here, here's what's going on, you know? Um, and then I just really yeah. like, um, long form podcast conversations from people mm-hmm. who are heterodox thinkers. Like they are very aware of, they're very anti-tribalistic. Most of them would probably be left leaning on social issues, um, people like Barry Weiss and um, Andrew Sullivan would be right leaning, but they're, they're just, they're, you get the sense they're honest thinkers, but they're having like long conversations with people and, and they're willing yes. to say, oh, that's a good point or push back. And, and it is more thoughtful. Is that, is that all that to say? Because especially in the work that I do, I do want to be in, informed with that. Mm-hmm. Do you have any other suggestions on what I should be doing? So I don't sell my soul to <laughs> the devil, like, right? Like, handing my That's heart true. and emotions or, over actually. to somebody that just wants to <laughs> make me angry. No, you know, I, I think that's as you're saying that, Preston. I think podcasts are um, a really special uh, oasis in our time of in, in technology in terms of that. Like, because if you're listening um, to content that is thoughtful, I mean, you have to be choosy, right? I mean, then yeah. there's like there's podcasts that are all yeah. about the you know, the hullabaloo and everything, but yeah. it, like the, the kind of podcast you're talking about, I'm, I'm very, I'm very similar. You know, I, mm-hmm. I like to hear long conversations. I like to hear people I disagree with. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to hear, but I want to hear their argument. I don't right. just want to hear the the bullet. And so, yeah, I did subscribe <laughs> to the pour over as well, that, okay. based on your <laughs> yeah. recommendation. Yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah. we, we love that. Um, we, but yeah, to, to hear things cause, cause almost everything is, well, I could probably say everything is way more complicated and way more nuanced than we, yeah. than a, any headline will tell you. Right. Right. So, so I really think that listening carefully to conversations is a key way. The visuals, um, just a, a, my, my wife and I, uh, several years ago, we used to, we would go to, um, we had a, a membership to a gym in our neighborhood and, um, we didn't, I've again, in, in the name of intentionality, I haven't done cable, haven't okay. done cable news for the longest time, but we'd be on the elliptical. And yeah. there would be CNN, Fox, MSNBC on the walls, but their audio is off. Oh. So I'm not, and I'm, I'm listening to a podcast, probably listening to you well, on, <laughs> on, um, on, a, on an elliptical. Right. And, but the drama, like watching yeah. out, you know, Putin, dun, 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 yeah. um, you know, and then, and Trump, dun, 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 whatever it's, um, the, the, it's, it's like a movie scene. When you look at it without the audio on, you can just tell how you're being manipulated yeah. in the, in the way that things are presented. There's yeah. no truth. There's no, it's just keep watching because yeah. in this episode of destroying our world, here's what's happening. You know, it's right. just, ah, what do you do? And then, so as a Christian, you're like, Lord, help me to have discernment. Help me to have wisdom. What do mm-hmm. I do in this cultural moment? Mm-hmm. What do you think about, um, this is going to, I, 
change change the channel a little bit, but uh, Elon Musk and his whole Twitter takeover. Um, oh that, wow, that's been entertaining. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> or are you you're probably not, are you on social media or no? Uh, I just a little a okay. tiny bit. So I'm not. Uh, there are some people in the space that are just no. Um, okay. I basically, if you follow me, you'll hear me. You'll see me post things like you should be, you don't use social media, but, <laughs> but it's a little tiny bit, Twitter, like tweet. five minutes a week. Yeah, okay, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I do just a little bit. Um, some, I use Twitter and Facebook yeah. basically, um, just very, very little. Uh, but, um, yeah, that's a really interesting thing. I think it's too early to tell. I think again, it's kind of hullabaloo. Um, he, uh, I, I think, I think both sides, again, when you listen to the conversations about what people are talking about with Twitter, both sides have something to say, right? <laughs> the, the right feels suppressed by the previous way. <laughs> and now the left are like, oh no. Um, so now they're wanting to create their own alternative yeah. Twitters. And, um, yeah. I guess to me, it's too, a little too early to tell. Um, but it does show how influential those kind of platforms have yeah. become yeah. that 148 or 200 and, you know, 96 characters, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, can ha have make such yeah. a difference and elevate things to such a degree that, that that's what we're talking about. Right. And then that again, <laughs> is that really, um, it's so yeah. sad. I'll see people on Twitter and they're, you could just tell instantly the kinds of people that are just so addicted to Twitter. Like they just, oh man, they're tweeting it all throughout the day They're You could just tell they're angry and this and that. My, one of my favorite guilty pleasures right now is looking at people, um, complaining about being shadow banned or like, can anybody see this mm. tweet anymore? It's got like a thousand likes and they have like 15,000 <laughs> followers. I'm like, <laughs> can anybody see it? I'm like, yeah, a thousand people liked it. I don't know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's like, so like, you know, it's like their whole world is kind of like crashing down. And, and I understand there could be a place for, if somebody it's like for a business purpose, it, it is. A, it, and sure. that's what I've used it over the years, you know? Um, but yeah. even that, I don't know, like, Twitter. I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's, yeah, overplayed. I, I read a study that said, you know, of the, I don't know how many people have an account. I, don't quote me. It's something like 20, maybe 20% of people in America, but like 3% of that 20% are posting 90% of the content. So it's like a, that's right. Twitter represents a tiny percentage of like real life. Mm -hmm. And so when people live in that world, but they think it is re real life. And it's like, oh, it's so sad. Like I, you know, I've had moments where I'm like, I spent too long on Twitter and you just feel horrible. You just feel angry. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, but people that do that every day and they're not like, that's just so sad. And they're, right. I think they have these friends out there and they're fighting justice by tweeting things at Trump or whatever. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this, it's just, it, it is truly sad. It's like, ah, <clears throat> but what do you yeah. do? You know? Um, yeah, that's right. The the app, the, I, I, I use, um sometimes I use Hootsuite which is, mm -hmm. do you know? Yeah. Where you can, I know what that is. Uh huh. That's great because you don't see anything. You just post something. It right. goes to Facebook, goes to Twitter. And you don't see it. It's just like, all right, your post, your tweet was posted. Every now yep. and then I'll look like a week later. I'm like, oh man, man, that didn't go over well. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I'm not, I don't, I don't, you know, because I'm not just sitting there, tweet it. And five seconds later, did anybody like it? You know, but, um, right. Yeah. I used yeah. to, I used to, this is fun. I don't know if I ever said this on online, but, or live, but I used to use Twitter. This is probably years ago to rhetorically push the envelope as far as I could go to see where the line was. Mm, <laughs> so wow. People thought I was kind of like really edgy. I'm like, no, I'm just kind of using you as like a testing ground to say, okay, I want to say this in my book. Then it's like, well, that's too far. I'm like, okay, cool. I know. I know. I'll bring it back a little bit. So yeah, I would, I would just kind of like, yeah. How, how is this phrase being used? You know, how, how's it landing with people or not, whatever. But I don't, I don't. Yeah. I don't stir that's it up great. on Twitter. Like I used to, but. This episode is sponsored by One Million Home, an awesome organization dedicated to winning the battle to get orphan kids home. Did you know that there are 5.4 million kids in orphanages worldwide? Did you also know that the majority of those kids, given the right support, could actually return to their parents or other family members? 
In the face of family separation throughout the world, God is setting the lonely into their families. And One Million Home is doing an amazing job creating pathways to reunify kids with their families throughout the world. You might remember that I had uh, Brandon Stiver on the show from One Million Home a few podcasts ago. It was episode 989. And I was so blown away at the amazing work that he and One Million Home are doing. So we are inviting uh, Theology and Raw listeners, the Theology and Raw community to join the movement of family reunification for Giving Tuesday this year. That's November 29th. It's coming up. It only costs $250 to reunite a kid with their family. So that's what your Giving Tuesday gift will be going to. So if you have a heart for orphans, and if you're a Christian, you kind of should, um, and you want to contribute to more effective and biblical ways of caring for orphans, then go to onemillionhome.com forward slash T-I-T-R. That's the number one, then million home, no spaces, dot com forward slash T-I-T-R. Tell me about your kids. What did you do? How old are your daughters and how did you guys handle social media? Were they, were they old enough to where they were raised in the social media world? or, or they, So we missed that a little bit. I mean, our, our kids, it's always hard to say the numbers out loud, but the oldest is 35 and the oh. youngest is 20. Six. The youngest is 26. So um, we did kind of miss it. I mean, um, uh, Facebook was becoming a thing when the youngest were teenagers. Um, so, but not to this degree. We were late adopters with our kids. We were just um, very much late adopters. We had all kinds of practices in our home that I, I wish we'd have done more. I, when I wrote the book, I, I mean, I see all kinds of mistakes, things I wouldn't have done, like even flip phones, you know, could yeah. sometimes kind of go sideways depending on how they're, you know, how they're used and, yeah. um, the conversations I, um, now that I've, now what I've learned so much more about it, I would have done a lot more discipleship around it a lot more. Um, and we did, but it's not, not at the level that I really would have wished, but, yeah. um, but yeah, we did, you know, filters and, um, single TV in the home, a lot of things like Andy Crouch talks about, okay. um, really in his book, we, we really did a lot of that kind of stuff, a single computer in a public location. Yeah. Um, you know, even as nerdy as I was, I didn't get my first smartphone until 2010. Hmm. And, um, and that's when I started, you know, I noticed the impact on me hmm. even just then. And that's, that sparked a lot of things this is in my journey in terms of things. So hmm. that really made a difference. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a, I've been generally, um, like I say, late adopter and careful, but I would have, yeah. I would have made some improvements over time. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's so hard. Yeah. It it's is. Like, it's like a rubber band where you, we keep pushing against the rubber band to set boundaries and that rubber band is just, is just snapping back, you know? Um, it is, luckily, it like, is. And yeah. the pressure in the culture is so yeah. huge and yeah. it's increased. It's just seems like, and, and again, we always talk about 2020, it's going to be BC and AC, AC, right before COVID and after COVID, yeah. right? So it's like, like that emptied up even more and, and the pressure and all that to conform. It's so, so mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, um, opinions or thoughts on, um, like content moderation, the whole debate about should big tech be censoring certain things or should it just be, a you know, I know like Elon says, he's a free speech absolutist. Obviously you can't yell fire in a crowded theater and, or yeah. make verbal violent threats toward people. Although you, you see that stuff still, but um, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Or is that, would you say that's not in, in your main area or? It's not in my main area. I, to me though, those, those kind of ideas, they, so it shows the importance of the platforms mm -hmm. that we care so much about what's on there. Mm -hmm. And so what I would want to tell people is, you know, especially as Christians, we need to care less about what's on there and spend less time. Right. Yeah. Um, why I would be asking the question, why is it so, why does it matter so much whether this, I mean, cause obviously, you know, Russian influence on elections or whatever, you know, all these allegations of these things that are really influencing and swaying things. Mm -hmm. Why? And are we okay with that? And then, so sure, if we have content moderation, who's pulling those strings? To me, it, one of the things that breaks my heart is hearing the stories of the content moderators of Facebook that are just miserable because of the horrible things they have to filter, oh, even really? today, right? Oh, wow. I mean, because they, they're, I mean, the mental health of yeah. those people, they see the worst of the worst. Oh, wow. And then, and have to, you know, you imagine just the darkness that's out there and they just like doing that eight hours a day and they uh, just, yeah. It's, it's horrible. So I, yeah, so it's, I would be more concerned about, um, uh, de-emphasizing the power of these platforms altogether mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than, 
uh, let's let's give someone the ability to pull the strings and make the content okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 For me, I, I'm, I, I'm not, it's not my, I would, I would, it makes more, as I listen to kind of people talk, it makes more sense to be more on the free speech side. Sure. And it's like, sure. well, you didn't let all this stuff, you know, run, you know, all the hate speech, all this. And it's like, well, what's the other option? You have some 22 year old in San Francisco tell me that my content isn't, you know, <laughs> good or whatever like is right you know, right it's just so oh, it's, subjective very, and i just don't i don't I'm trust really people at the top to like be the arbiters yeah. of truth and good and beauty you know so uh, yeah that's so true yeah no i think especially i mean you know the the, the debates around covid for example and we yeah. don't want to necessarily spend a lot of time on this but there were a lot of reasonable um critiques of how things were handled mm -hmm. but those were suppressed in or or labeled as misinformation that is a problem that that that's a so I would I'm yeah. with you on that. I would definitely want that yeah. to be biased more towards the free speech side. But yeah. still, again, man, the power there. That was I, that was that I, I feel like early on in COVID, and I, I who am I? I don't know it, you know. But um, it, that was like, oh, this could be a good case for like, okay, let's let's censure misinformation because it's a global pandemic. It's affect we're all a big neighborhood. It's affecting people. But then sure. through COVID, you started seeing like the good people who were like in charge of whatever they, they you just start seeing weird stuff come out with them and, and not mm -hmm. handling data correctly. And just this, that was so, so it's like, okay, who, who do I, who do I trust now? You know, anyway, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to wake up the COVID monster by saying, anything. no, I know me neither. <laughs> I, but, yeah. but, but I, I think that was a perfect example of like <clears throat> now two years in and we know a lot more information. Like, well, wait a minute. Well, we know now you, that totally goes against what you told us was truth a year ago, you know? So that's right. Um, and you know we're all learning, I guess. I don't know. Um, right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. H how? Um, I'm. I'm not a fearful like. I'm more of a hopeful kind of person, but I am. I'm nervous about the. I mean, we just went through an election. Now I didn't really pay much attention to it. I don't even know who won, but. Um, uh, the 2024 election mm -hmm. I, has the church learned its lesson, or was this just going to be? Mm -hmm more i mean we already major gaping wound in the church right just totally wrecked havoc on the discipleship of the church mm -hmm. families broken apart every single pastor i talked to said this was the hardest year of my pastoring it had it had little to do with like the fact that we had a pandemic it was now you know if i didn't say the right thing about wearing or not wearing a mask people were leaving <laughs> the church and leaving their families and just I, I saw just the church implode over stuff that had nothing to do with theology or like you know, I don't love Jesus anymore. I'm out of here. It's like, yeah, that's hard. But like, you guys mm -hmm. are wearing masks. You're not wearing a mask. We're out of here, you know? And I, I just, it, the pastors are just like floored by this. Right. What do you think, Scott? I mean, have we learned our lesson? I don't think, I don't know if we have. And how can we? Like, yeah. we need to start preparing. I mean, here, I, I want, and I don't know if I have the right answer, but I just, I think right now, Christian leaders need to be, start discipling their people. In, in, a, in a better, more Christian way of, of separating, of seeing how you're just being used by these outlets and not just taking yourself off the steady drip of discipleship that is just pulling you away from the heart of Christ, you know, whichever side you're, you're on, you know? Absolutely. Uh, that's such a good point, Preston. I, I, I can't, I, I think, I think I would say pretty confidently we have not learned our lesson. Um, the, the problem is that we don't, I don't think we know it. We're not looking at what's happening with the, with our acculturation to technology as discipleship. Mm. Uh, in, in my book, I, I spend a lot of time talking about Deuteronomy six, mm. which is, you know, the Shema, but then, you know, um, hero Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Mm -hmm. Then you shall talk about it, right? Talk about these words, which I commanded you today shall be on your heart. Teach them when, when you walk along the road, when you sit in your home, when you lie down, when you rise up, put it on your gates, put it on your doors. What are we doing instead? That so so yeah. what I, well, the point I make with that is that was God's plan to teach the slaves, the the newly freed slaves, to disciple them in His ways, immersion in the, the Word. Yeah, yeah. What are we doing instead? On our while we're walking, while we're driving, on our walls. As we travel along, we are being discipled. Mm -hmm. Why? How? We're being discipled by social media. We're being discipled by a constant feed of input. And like you just said, on how to respond to it. So that if a pastor from the stage says something we don't like, we've been discipled. Oh, this is when I feel this feeling in my heart of the, they're wrong. What I do is I need to make an angry comment. 
That's the yeah. pro- you know, yeah. that's discipleship. That's that's ra- rather than as you as you model so well. If I hear something I disagree with, I'll be like, huh, where'd you come with? Where'd you come up with that? And <laughs> you know, what do you mean by that? You know, and having a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not doing that. We're just as a church, we're sadly going along for the ride. We're yeah. still like youth groups are being managed on Instagram, right? Because all the kids are on Instagram. And like, well, that's not that's not right. What we're saying is we're saying that these tools are okay as long as you but what what they're not recognizing the intentionally addictive properties to that and what it's doing to the kids. Mm-hmm. Um, we're doing the same it's the same way. We're not we're not coaching people through how to live Christianly and think Christianly and follow Jesus with all our hearts and and apply Deuteronomy 6 in our homes in a different way, like with the word, with mm-hmm. the practices, with the authentic community. Mm-hmm. And that that's all I think what we need to be doing instead of mm-hmm. just going along with accepting what the culture gives us. Do you think, I mean, does this need to be preached from the stage? Like to be doing a series on technology, news, and discipleship? I mean, I, I know we always just punt to like, do a sermon on it and that'll solve it. But I, I, <laughs> <clears throat> I, I know pastors like, oh man, if I touch... Politics, and I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying advocate for like a party or another, but like help people to be dis- to be Christian disciples while mm-hmm. living in Babylon, where the leaders of Babylon are grasping at your uh, your allegiance, clawing absolutely, at it. and they have it. They have a huge, they've got a huge hand around around your wallet, around your heart, and they're just squeezing it, and we, people don't even realize that. Um, that's right. And that's you can right. preach I mean, all the sermons love about that, love, Jesus love Jesus and live for Jesus. But if they're, if they have this steady diet of just stuff, that's just not that, then your sermons, I don't think are going to do a whole lot. I don't know. I don't want to be cynical, but I'm kind of cynical. Well, no. I mean, you've got 30 minutes once a week <laughs> versus eight hours a day. Yeah. You know, you just, just the numbers don't add up and, and what those eight hours a day are doing in terms of priming you to not think deeply to not. And then what is that replacing? What are those that's it's replacing deep prayer. It's replacing, mm. replacing silence. It's replacing, mm. reflecting on the word memory. It's respect. It's, it's replacing actual face-to-face conversations. It's, res, you know, all the things we're losing because we're giving it out to our technology. So, I mean, yeah, I would love to think that, that churches need to be teaching, these concepts about what technology is doing, because that really is and in terms of and framing it in terms of discipleship. Yeah. Um, d- just so that they can understand this is disciple. The- discipleship works. Mm-hmm. It's the content and the method, mm-hmm. right? Well, that's why we're all, that's why the stats we've been discipled to think everybody needs a phone and this is how you should use it in your life. And when you're tired, you should turn on, you should have a TV in your bedroom and you should turn it on. And, you know, like these are, we've been, you know, and I want to just relax. What does relax mean? It means turn on the, turn on something and, and, oh, you know, rather than, you know, oh, I want to see how someone's doing. I'll go on Facebook as opposed to call them. On the, you know, <laughs> we've been, these are, these are, this is discipleship and it's mm-hmm. new. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and it's, and it's, again, intentionally decided that that's the thing that again, as, as, um, people dig into that. The reason these things come to top of mind, oh gosh, I'm bored. I wonder what's happening on platform X. Yeah, That's by design. They did that. They wanted to be the first of mind. That's a habit that has formed. And those are the things. Huh. That's what I would hope churches would start talking about as opposed to, Lord, I'm afraid. What should I do? Oh, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Like if the word was there instead of, oh, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, Google it. You know, those, that's discipleship. That's huh. the that's the contrast between what what we're being taught in the culture being between what God would want us to be doing. Interesting. Do you think that churches should use? I, I think there's probably two different approaches to this. One would be churches or Christian leaders helping people to just wean themselves off of these platforms, or the other approach is they're going to be on Instagram anyway. What if we as a church sent out like daily devotions? through Instagram, or maybe you had a podcast where they can, you know, have a two hour conversation after this, you know, on Monday morning where pastors are banting around about the passage they just preached on or, or something, or, or maybe a whole different thing. It's not sermon related. Um, mm-hmm. Should we be using the channels they are already on or trying to tell them to get off the channels as a whole, or is it kind of a both and maybe? I would be much more in the lines of, um, uh, of as far as the addic- not using the addictive technology to try to get our mission done. Okay. <laughs> there's a there's a debate over um, should we be sharing the gospel on TikTok, for example? Right. Yeah. Um, can you share the gospel on TikTok? Um, 
Well, the Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message, which means um, okay. it's what you have to do to succeed on a platform is to be the way that platform is to put yourself in the mold of what that platform does. So um, the way that platform works is short attention span, mm. quick hits. Nobody's going to, re again, it's not about reason, it's about feeling. So what are you going to do? You're going to be sensational. You're going to be, you're going to have to get their attention. What do I have to do to get their attention? Well, you have to be obnoxious. You have to be, you know, you have to, you have to push the envelope. You have to do whatever. Uh, for me, I'm like, this is intentionally addictive technology. We need to, we need to reject it. Okay. And we need to go towards platforms of like podcasts and that kind of a thing. Um, the, the problem with the church using this technology, again, this is based on my research. The, the problem with the is, so let me just take a quick step back. There yeah. a lot of books and a lot of people trying to talk about technology is a tool. It's, it's amoral. Um, it's, um, it's, you know, it's just how you use it. Right. But that's, um, not, that's not true, right? We've already kind of, it is not true, yeah, Preston. Yeah. It's not true. I mean, yes, a pencil <laughs> is a tool, right? Um, uh, you know, um, the printing press made a huge impact on the culture. It was not designed to be intentionally addictive. TikTok is designed to exploit you. Okay. Hmm. Instagram is designed to be intentionally addictive. Those, these is a very big different thing. So we have to understand it's kind of like, you know, all the kids are sitting around smoking crack. Should I go and smoke crack with them and share the gospel? <laughs> well, Okay, Jesus would probably go and talk to them, but I don't think he would be smoking crack. And so it's kind of that, it's that same, and and in fact, the, some of the books I cite, it's the same, the, the brain chemistry, the dopamine cycles, yeah. the, the things that are happening to kids especially, but also adults on social media and video games, it activates the same systems in the brain as heroin and, yeah. and drugs and, 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 right? So it's, so no, I would say the church needs to understand that this is not just a tool to be used, um, to, to be bent to our will. This is not the tool you're looking for. Okay. The tool you're looking for is authentic relationships, conversations, face-to-face -face conversations, and, and real discipleship. In fact, I love what you said. I, um, I just was been preparing for this conversation and refreshed on, um, embodied. You talk about, um, if, if people don't have authentic communities, they're going to look to the internet yeah. to find it. Yeah. That's what the church needs to be about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And would you say, and the, going back to the medium is the message, um, I always thought that was, um, who would you say came up with that? Marshall that? McLuhan. Oh, okay. I think it's quoted in, um, what's the book you quoted earlier? <laughs> See, my brain is- Oh, Amusing Ourselves Today. Yeah, I think oh, he- yeah. okay. yep. Yep, he's quoting McLuhan. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Um, yep. Is that why something like tick, like sharing the gospel on TikTok is it's designed to be short attention span, get your attention, boom, and get out of there, and that communicates something about the gospel itself when you're presenting the gospel in 15 seconds, whatever? Is that kind of the argument that the very medium here, in a sense, cheapens the message you're trying to communicate? It's not, not even that it cheapens, it packages it so that it says something different. It's oh, okay. it's 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 trivializing it, but it's also so it's imagine what you're doing. Um, I I as a as an experiment, I used TikTok for five minutes and uninstalled it just because <laughs> as for my work for my day job, I'm a software engineer for Covenant Eyes, and so um, oh, okay. which is uh, which is like one of the the largest internet pornography accountability yeah. software. So I was doing an experiment and I hadn't installed TikTok before. Um, so I, and I actually wrote a big article on it, on my, on my blog recently to kind of describe what's going on with TikTok, for example, uh, the other platforms are doing it too. In fact, Instagram and YouTube want to be TikTok because TikTok's mm -hmm. being so good. Like everybody's becoming more TikTok like because TikTok has figured out on the next level of addiction. Um, huh. but so I installed TikTok. I, um, I, I, you put in your name and your birth date, nothing else, no, no gender, nothing. <clears throat> First video that comes up is two women in bikinis, one of them grabs the other one's shirt and tries to pull it down. Hmm. I swipe away. No. Okay. Next video, cute dog video. Next yeah. video. It's, it's all about swiping videos. And again, oh. it's analyzing that. So imagine you're swiping along, you're swiping along and there's a pastor sharing the gospel. And then you swipe and you see, and then you swipe and then you see, and you've forgotten, hmm. right? You've, uh, you've, you're, you're, 
my contention is that platform is designed for one thing. It's designed for addiction. It's designed mm. to be distracting. It's not designed to share the gospel. Um, so I would, and even in the case of doing that, I mean, the argument is, you know, there's 2 billion people on, on this platform. Yeah. So we need to be there. Well, if you, the only reason, like, like I said, the only reason you really need to be there is to tell them to get off of that <laughs> and to go and live and, and, and understand what's happening to you. This is the reason you're on here. And the reason you think this is awesome is because they've made it. They're exploiting you. Hmm. You're being manipulated. Hmm. It's hurting you. And it's not good. When we say, okay, we're sharing the gospel on this platform, we're saying, this is good. We're blessing it. We're sanctifying it. We're saying, this is a thing. And yeah. I'm, my argument is we really need to watch out for that. We need yeah. to really be careful with that. But the same way, so I, I could hear, I, I, I think I would agree with you, or I don't know enough to agree or disagree, but I could see someone saying, well, yeah, it's still, it, you know, either they're going to be swiping on bikinis and otters or whatever, uh, but then there's a pastor and then of the 10 million people who saw the pastor for 15 seconds, maybe a thousand yeah. clicked on it and they got another pastor, another pastor, they come to Jesus. So it's like, it's, it yeah. can kind of like the roadway signs, you know, repent or go to hell or whatever. You know, like, <laughs> you know, right. right. I know. I kind of like, is that worth the money? Like, it's like, I, I can see know. someone saying like, well, it's, it's something they see Budweiser, they see this ad, this, whatever. And then they see something about the God. But yeah, I, I, I do tend, I, I do think we need to, reflect more deeply on the medium. I, 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 yeah, again, just amusing ourselves to death was really, I mean, just the advent of the TV and what that did to how right. we even get our information. is just, I just recently read it. I, I didn't, I read mm -hmm. it a year ago. I was like, this felt like it was written like two years ago, but it was, it's so God. powerful. It's yeah. so powerful. Too bad he's not yeah. alive anymore. I'd like a <laughs> 30 year anniversary version of it. Um, yeah. well, Doug, I mean, I got, let's see, did I have, Oh, one more question. So with the skyrocketing of TikTok and this shorter, everything shorter, 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 and our attention span is so short, why is it that some of the most popular podcasts are super long? I mean, take someone like Joe Rogan, who mm. three or four hour, just sometimes just talking to his comedian buddies about nothing, mm -hmm. and it's 10 million views. Or other ones, I, I was listening to one, um, it was a six hour podcast episode. And I'm like mm -hmm. four hours in, you know, and, and okay, that's, that's me, but are these two different kinds of people that are, um, some are actually wanting longer form things. And then the also have people that just want the TikTok, and there's no merging. Or do you feel like deep down the person who is a, unintentionally addicted to this TikTok thing actually is longing for something more meaningful, something more thoughtful, something longer. Does that question make sense? I kind of, Oh, wow. Kind of there's a lot there. On the fly. Um, like why I is Joe Rogan so popular? I don't understand why he's so popular. Well, I think I think <laughs> there is a market for that. Certainly, there's a market for the long form. I, I again, I would say that podcasts are are um, they're not they don't fall into the intentionally addictive okay. patterns. They're not exploiting your dopamine cycle. They're not they're not messing with your behavioral psychology. They're not you know they're not looking at okay what it's it's a conversation. So okay. I think that's why I think podcast uh, the medium is the message. Yeah. So the podcast is the medium, and you have a whole different way of doing that. And certainly you have different audiences. Churches should have podcasts, for example. I think that's totally <laughs> the medium to share the gospel. Yeah. Um, where TikTok is again, it's a whole different thing. I think the the what's what's the goal? What's the reason for that? What's the so oh. I I would suspect it's different audiences in general. Yeah. But okay. to you what well, the thing you ended with, are they looking for meaning? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I that I really reach out to people in terms of their uh, trying to connect with them in my book is that, you know, people wake up after however many years of addiction and they're like, you know what? I thought I'd be farther along in my life by mm -hmm. now. I thought I'd be, I thought I would have done this and that. I thought I would have graduated. I thought I'd be married. I thought I'd be blah blah blah. But no, I've got high video game scores and no <laughs> you know, but I'm still in my parents' basement or whatever, you know, it's, it's like all those kinds of things. It's like, this is not, this is, um, it, there is this sense of longing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but there, but then the, because they've been discipled into the use of this technology, mm -hmm. they think the answer is there as well when actually it's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you have any thoughts on, do you know about Minecraft, the video game? Do you know about that? Do you have any thoughts on I that? I do. I do. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I know, I know enough to be dangerous on it. I, Okay. Um, is that in the category of that? Cause it, my, my son loves it Yeah, and he would choose Minecraft over watching a TV show or movie. And I'm like, ah, I didn't want to, you know, he's just on video games. And then he even said like, well, 
I'm, I'm actually, this is more creative than just sitting and watching a show and you and mom are watching, everybody else is watching a, a show or a movie or something. I'm like, oh, that's kind of a good point. Like, I think, I don't know. Or, or is it? Yeah. So is there an addictive element there that we don't really see or? So I, my understanding with, it's been a little while since I've looked at it, but my understanding with Minecraft is that it has the option to have multiplayer mode and connect out into the internet. So like he's not, yeah, he's so, not doing any of that. Yeah. Okay. So that, yeah. so on the other hand, then if it's not that, that was where I'd be the watch out would be the okay. connect that I would want to, you know, be very concerned about that as a yeah. dad. Um, but otherwise it's much more like playing with Legos, I suppose. Um, the watch out, the watch out is uh, with, and this applies to any video game. If, is that like what they live for? Is this, hmm. that's the favorite, like if you could do anything, what would you do? It'd be if if that is the video, if the video game is the answer, then it is. Okay. It, then then something is happening to make it more addictive. You know, hey, you want to come out with me and go get some ice cream? No, I'd rather play. I'd rather play Minecraft. Right. I would be really okay. concerned about that. Okay. Um, so that's that's the watch out that I would have. I, but I would say in general, you know, it's not Fortnite. You know, it's not right. going around and killing yeah. all your friends. You know, it's building stuff and imagination. Yeah. And I so I would I would buy into that. But I would also go, eh. Okay. Watch out for the multiplayer and yeah, watch out for the obsession. Ad addictive tendencies. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Good. So your like book is addicted to Legos. Right? Oh, I play. Yeah. No, I did. I was, a, yeah. And even that, like, I, I remember when I was a kid, well, I don't know. Did, did I prefer Legos over anything else or was it just kind of, if I didn't have anything else to do, I, I, I don't remember. It was decades ago, but um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, again, say the name of your book, Unintentional. The, the subtitle is unintentional how screens secretly shape your desires and how you can break free okay and it's on amazon i assume or is it on your website it is. Or, okay it's on amazon it's okay. on um and it has i have an audiobook it, it's on audible okay um cool. so yeah it's there awesome. doug and, thanks so much for being on yeah. theology in Iran. i learned a ton and uh yeah i hope you have a third version of this book <laughs> in a couple of years maybe you just need to be updated in every couple of years absolutely thank you so much preston i'm just honored to be on your podcast i Our really pleasure, appreciate man. it yeah thanks pleasure. for all you do sure This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.